at this time, I would love for all of you to give a round of applause to our keynote speaker, Matthew Chang. <laughs> Thanks so much. All right, super. I think I'm gonna have to take the mic off. The other speakers are a little bit below me on the podium. Okay, students, good morning. Good morning. Thanks for making the trek. I heard some of you guys came from some counties pretty far away. Um, super, we got the presentation up. Well, listen, uh, uh, I, that was a great bio, and it's always kind of awkward to hear somebody introduce you, and they, they try to sing your praises in a paragraph, and then you say, no, I don't, you know, the spotlight shouldn't be on me. The spotlight should be on the students that are here. It's your futures, and it's what you're going to do with your life that is, is why we're here. Um, so a couple things to add, because I'm going to react to the room. Do we have any junior ROTC students in the room? Hands up if you are. Hands out of your pocket if you are. Well, that's awesome. Part of my journey was I was four years junior ROTC in high school, and I was ended up being the cadet commander of a Naval Junior ROTC. Um, went to Georgia Tech on a Navy scholarship for ROTC, and it was my dream to wear a uniform like these gentlemen sitting here, and unfortunately, I was the last class when the military was actually shrinking. So they, a lot of us got letters that were disappointing before we graduated. Um, and then, of course, things changed a few years after that. So anyways, um, life comes at you fast. I was supposed to be a military officer and it didn't work out for me. Um, after that, I went as a Georgia Tech engineer, I thought, hey, I'm gonna design bridges. That seems super cool. And then I realized we're not really building a lot of fancy bridges in America anymore. Those days have passed. Only one person got to be the lead designer of the Golden Gate Bridge. Um, and then today I run a robotics company. So as, uh, uh, Jennifer pointed out when she introduced this, there's going to be change. Life is going to change. Things are going to change. The encouragement I have for you is to support your country. What you can just do is focus on being really good at what you do. So whatever, wherever you land in life, whatever it is that you're going to do, just focus on being really good at that. Um, so we'll go next slide. <clears throat> So there's going to be some words on this slide. They're a little bit small for the folks in the back, so I'm just going to get you the highlights. Um, a little bit about the company that I founded that's based in Jacksonville Beach. We are a robotic system engineering company. We design robot systems, and then we install them. Where do we install them? I'll get to the point uh, throughout the, uh, the presentation, but the short answer is pretty much everywhere. Um, our journey, uh, as was mentioned, we started in 2017, so that probably seems like forever ago for you guys. And since I've had three kids since then, it feels like forever ago for me too. But um, early on, we didn't actually know that we wanted to be an AI-enabled robot design firm. Our customers asked us to do that. So what we had was an open mind and a can-do attitude. And then we had several customers ask us, hey, can you design a robotic system that's powered by AI? So the rest of the workforce, if we have any adults in the room, for the past year, here's a secret, they have been absolutely panicked about AI. They're like, chat GPT and AI, what am I gonna do about that? Um, we were fortunate, we got a head start six or seven years ago using AI-enabled robotics as our primary means of conducting our work. Uh, next. So what we have right now going on is a paradigm shift. We're uh, here at the National Defense Industrial Association Conference. Every company that manufactures in the NDIA has automation. They have automation somewhere. They have machinery, production lines, process lines. And so that is basically the paradigm of your parents. Your parents grew up in an automation world where machinery and automation was happening around them. When I was your age, I was coming of age when the internet was becoming a thing. And believe it or not, that created a generational shift. The people that were born before me were born without internet. And then when I went to high school, I went to high school with internet. Those were the glory days of the, the unfiltered internet when you could download anything and send anything you wanted. And there were no rules. Um, that gave us an advantage because I grew up in the internet age, even up until today, it's just been natural to me. It's been fluent. What you guys have as an opportunity is to grow up in the artificial intelligence age because it's happening right now 
as you're making your decisions and as you're forming your worldviews, it's gonna be natural to you. That is gonna be a superpower for you going forward. So the paradigm shift is, the paradigm of your parents is automation. The paradigm of your generation is autonomy. Autonomy is enabled by artificial intelligence applied to the things all around us. It could be cars, as you see outside, it could be computing systems, or it could be robotics. So in terms of the new paradigm, um, when we apply AI-powered robotics to existing automation systems, we end up with a network of automation. And so what that does is it says, hey, all these things that we have around us, manufacturing facilities, distribution facilities, production cells inside of buildings, we can connect those with autonomous robotics now. And what that does is it creates a network of automation and it unleashes a new level of productivity. That change is something that you guys will each participate in in your daily lives. So what does it look like? Um, this is an example of a factory that we did a retrofit for. This was a highly automated factory. It makes products that definitely your parents consume. You may not yet, and someday you will once you start studying for exams in college. Um, and we installed autonomous robotics to connect all of the machinery. Prior to this, the machinery was connected with humans, forklift drivers, workers, people loading materials into machines. And after we were done, the workers took a step back they managed a fleet of robots and the production cells ran themselves with autonomous robots supplying them. So when we go do engineering, what does it look like? And if you're in the back, I'm sorry, it's not gonna be the best to see, but we have a good website, you can check that out. Uh, is This is what it looks like. We come up with visuals to help our customers see what it looks like to install robotics and then we plan. This crazy diagram here is called a spaghetti diagram. And what it shows is when we have self-driving robots inside of factories, they make their own decisions on where they go and how they get there. And so what we're showing here is in a model, all the different paths they took to accomplish the same missions. And so we use these as tools to basically help us plan and forecast how to design robotics with humans and how they can coexist. Why that's good is um, 100 years ago, we didn't have worker safety rules in this country. And working in manufacturing was very dangerous. Today, uh, you heard the dean introduce it, we have advanced manufacturing. Advanced manufacturing is generally very safe, but it's still hard on the body. In the future, and as you guys enter the workforce, manufacturing is gonna be something that equates to a high-tech job in Silicon Valley. You're gonna run a fleet of technology to build America's future. Next. Another use case I have for you, so that's smart manufacturing. Another use case I have for you is healthcare. So what's happening in healthcare? You guys can't read this, so I'll read it to you. <clears throat> By 2050, 20% of the population will be over 60. So once you get over 60, and I'm sorry for those of you in the room that are, if I offend you, but you need a lot more medical care. You just need a lot more medical care. So here's the question. Are 20% of you guys going to enter the healthcare field to take care of them. So that by the time you've learned your trade as a nurse or a doctor or my wife as a PA, that you can take care of the aging population. I didn't see any head nods, I saw a couple shakes. So is anybody here going into the medical field? Do we know? All right, so that's about 2%. As a professional engineer, let me tell you, that's 2%. That's not going to cut it. If we're going to take care of an aging population, we have to enable healthcare with technology. Next slide. And we're doing just that. So this is, our, this is uh, a first of a kind autonomous robotic system that's deployed in a hospital right here in Jacksonville. And the aim is to help nurses. Who bears the brunt of labor shortages in hospitals? It's the nurses. Who has to do the extra cleaning, the extra lifting, the extra patient care? It's nurses. And so if we're gonna help hospitals serve more people without having to increase their staff, it's gonna to have to be by helping nurses get more done in the day and to help their job be less strenuous. Um, this is informed by, my mom takes credit for this design. She was a nurse for 40 years. And then after serving the first two waves of COVID, she walked out of the hospital and said, I'm done. She was part of what they call the great resignation in healthcare. And on her, on her um, hospital floor, 40% of the staff resigned in one month. They served, 
They did the first two waves of COVID. They said, that's our duty. And then they said, that's enough. Well, what happens to the institutional knowledge of the people that we need to take care of us in the hospital when 40% of the experienced people walk out, right? That can be devastating. So if we're gonna get, keep those nurses happy, that's our number one priority in healthcare, then we need to give the nurses robots that they can use. When I got to tour this system, the nurses asked me, the first question they asked me was, when do we get to name them? <laughs> and I was like, oh, the robots are your pets. That's so perfect. I want you to think of them as your pets. You should love them, pet them on the head, and then you know, scold them when they don't behave. All right, next. So with that, I'm gonna take a quick break and see if we have any questions from the audience. Um, I do have plenty more content, but I don't think um, the, the point here is not to jam it all down your throat. So we showed you what a futuristic AI-enabled factory looks like. We showed you what an AI-enabled hospital could look like. And then as you guys think about your futures, where does that take you? So I'll take any questions, just raise your hand and I'll repeat your question. And then to the ROTC students, somebody has to go first, so figure it out. Yes, sir. Oh, okay, the question is what I study in college. I studied civil engineering and I actively skipped all the computer programming and electronics classes. Because I thought, hey, I'm gonna design bridges, who cares about the electronic stuff? And then I paid for it later in life when I had to go relearn it as an adult. Um, so that's, that was my point on life comes at you fast, but I did civil engineering at Georgia Tech. Yes, sir. Where could you see autonomy going in the next 10 years apart from healthcare? A part of healthcare? Okay, the question is where do you see autonomy going in the next 10 years? Well, I'll tell you the biggest, the biggest kind of smoke and mirrors out there is self-driving cars on the road. You have one out here, there's a self-driving shuttle. And in my professional career, we've been hearing about this for six, seven years, and they told us your kids will never have a car. Well, my daughter's five now, and I'm pretty sure she's gonna have a car. Um, what you're gonna see is, is incremental increase in autonomous driving. Uh, Teslas can already drive themselves, but you do have to pay 10 or $12,000 for the software upgrade to get the car to drive itself. Uh, Google is basically the only self-driving car company out there left. Uh, the other major ones like Uber, Lyft, and Cruise have basically gone out of business. Um, and even so, uh, Google, with all their money and power, hasn't been able to get out to our communities. You haven't seen a single Google driverless car in Jacksonville. Um, so in the, in the car space, that's gonna continue to go really slow. Uh, what you're gonna see is huge advances in things like unmanned drones, right? So Jacksonville is a drone hub. We have a lot of engineers and robotic startups working on drones. Those are already navigating for themselves within certain limits. And there was a recently an, uh, an approval that hospitals can launch life-saving drones using the, uh, the uh, emergency communication bandwidth to deploy Narcan and defibrillators. So saving people that are having a drug overdose or having a heart attack. Uh, so I think you're gonna see that move really fast. And then the Navy has a lot of initiatives specifically around autonomous um, war fighting. And they wanna have uh, firefighting drones that help put out the fires on a Navy ship while the, the ship is in battle. Um, or autonomous submarines. So you're gonna see huge advances in the non-roadway space moving really fast. Uh, and then I think the roadway space will tend to be the slowest because it has to coexist with us and our school buses and my driving and everybody else. G great question. Anyone else? What kind of software do you use when you're designing your products? Great, uh, the question is what kind of software do we use? We use, we use three layers of software. So the base layer is called firmware. So it's kind of like what's on your, your smartphone if you have an Android or an iPhone. And, and that is the embedded software on the robot. These, uh, the robots that I showed before are self-computing and they have their own software. So that's the firmware. Um, that's the base layer. The second layer is a middleware. And the middleware is trying to figure out what are you trying to do? If I'm in a factory, I care about efficiency and inventory. If I'm on the road doing public transit, I care about origins and destinations and public safety. 
Um, and then if I'm doing some sort of military operation, I have some, some crazy thing that I'm trying to do, right? So that's the middleware. And then the top level is what's called enterprise. Is the, is the autonomous unit, is it at a factory? Is it at an airport? Or is it on a city road? If so, I'm communicating to a different control tower. That control tower could be JTA here in Jacksonville, or it could be the, con the literal control tower at an airport. So those are the three levels and, and the languages, if you're asking specifically, the languages are gonna change by the time you graduate college. So don't even worry about it. Just learn them all and go fast. All right, do we have time for one more, Jer? Yes. Okay, one more. Yes, sir. The question is on training AI. Well, there's, there's kind of two uh, ways to do it. The first way you train AI is, is called particle theory. And in particle theory, in the software, you basically collide different options. Because at in every microsecond, the robot or the self-driving unit is making decisions. So you're colliding decisions and you're weighing them good or better okay or bad. Those are sometimes the choices that they have. So that's the first thing that you're doing is you're tuning a uh, software layer called particle theory and you're colliding decisions. The second thing um, that you're doing is you're training it in the field. And so if you hear Elon Musk, for example, talk about uh, self-driving, his whole thing is neural network, which is run more field trials run more field trials, run more field trials, run more field trials, and train the machine learning to think for itself. And so uh, what that applies to is, uh, does anybody in the room, and I know this is unfair for students, but I guess you can answer for your parents. Anyone in the room have a Tesla? I see one, two, a couple Teslas, three, four, okay. So thank you, you guys are making Elon Musk richer. If you have a Tesla, whether you know it or not, your Tesla is in shadow mode all the time. It's watching the way you drive. And then it's reporting on that behavior back to Tesla so they can fine tune their self-driving. So that's the way they're moving so fast and that's why they're probably, in my opinion, the greatest self-driving company out there is because you guys are all training them. Whoever here has a Tesla in their family is training Tesla cars to drive better. So I think with, with that, that's a wrap. And uh, I'll be on one of the panels soon. If you have another question, we can try to do that. Or uh, we have a booth outside and you can catch us in the hallway probably for the next hour or two, okay?